I was out camping with my friend Josiah in the mountains of Pennsylvania. It was the weird in between season after winter, but before spring really kicks off, there were still no leaves on the trees. But the day of hiking to the camping spot was about 60 degrees. I bought a small rifle as we wanted to do some plinking while we were out. We set up the camp at about 3 pm, leaving plenty of time for shooting. Just two buddies with guns out in the middle of the mountains. It was an incredible day. Night began to fall upon us, the air started to chill, and we built a fire for the night. Breaking out the bourbon, we talked about everything from future plans, girlfriends, and how society sucks. Josiah was used to camping, an industrious guy who had a passion for the outdoors, but to put it kindly, was not the smartest person I've ever met. From across the mountain, we could begin to hear coyotes. This is common when camping in Pennsylvania. Something you should know about coyotes is that they are incredibly noisy, and you can hear them from miles away. They are completely terrified of people, and therefore not a danger in the slightest. Or so I thought. The coyote calls were getting closer. Fine, we thought, as they were probably just using the trails to move more efficiently between the mountain peaks. This comfort in logic dissolved over the next hour or two, as the chilling howls kept getting closer. Josiah casually mentioned that the coyotes are close, but he and I both knew they were actively avoiding us. Shortly after he said this, the call stopped, and we were in complete silence. The pops and flickers of the dying campfire were our only indication that time itself hadn't frozen. That's when the bushes behind us began to rustle. Grabbing my flashlight, I scanned the woods around Josiah and me, only to catch the reflection of about half a dozen set of eyes in a circle around us. We both realize what is happening at the same time. Josiah grabs the rifle, hands it to me, and in return I hand him the flashlight. I slowly chamber around into the semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle, realizing that I probably don't have enough firepower to stop all of these coyotes should the situation escalate. Josiah and I stand with our backs towards the fire, him using the light to illuminate each coyote, the moment they break a twig underneath their movement. The coyotes, once illuminated, let out a bark, then move behind a tree. It appears as if hunting us is a game to them, as we stand there playing this game of high stakes flashlight tag with a rifle. I come to presume that these dogs are just coming out of a very harsh winter, and are probably starved. The standoff lasts for hours. Just as quickly as they surrounded us, they vanished into the darkness of the forest, only to resume their hunting calls on other mountains. I slept with a rifle that night. To this day, I still don't know why a typically harmless animal made us fight for our lives that night. The next morning, the situation didn't get any better. Central Pennsylvania has odd weather snaps. The day before, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This morning, there were about 3 inches of snow on the ground, temperatures were below 10 degrees, and heavy snowstorms rolling in. This was uncalled for by every weather agency I checked before we set out on this adventure. We packed for temperatures as low as 30, but not this tundra. Hands were bright red, dexterity lost, and I've been cold before, but this was the first time I was cold and unprepared enough to worry. Forget cooking breakfast, we needed to get out of there before the snow picked up. We tore down the tents, put on as many layers as possible, stretching shirts over shirts, packing bags, and cleaning the site in less than an hour. We make our way down the war trophy mountain that we battled for the night prior, but the trails below are covered by unpacked snow. We were going to have to use map and compass. We were also going to have to trailblaze through more difficult terrain if we wanted to make it to the car. We find a felled tree, lay out the map in the quickly accumulating snow and try to orient ourselves. 
If you've never been cold, hungry, and most likely dehydrated while trying to identify mountain peaks, and where they correspond on a map, then let me be the first to tell you that it is an aggravating experience, where any decision could mean the difference between living and dying. We find three identifiable peaks, see the creek that we crossed in the previous morning, and have a plan to get through the five miles as quickly as possible in a straight shot. This wasn't a typical hiking pace. We were just short of jogging, both to keep body temperature up and to expedite the trek until we could get into my used sedan view and pray that the heat worked. Four inches of snow were now weighing down our footsteps. As we approached the creek, we remember that the bridge we crossed before was another three miles out of our way, a distance we were unwilling to add to our already freezing bodies that was only just beginning to freeze, but quickly. Josiah heads northwest along the riverbank to look for a method of crossing. I direct myself southwest to do the same. The instructions were to not walk for more than 200 meters away from the central location, so that we could still hear each other calling that a solution was found. Within minutes, Josiah calls. A tree had fallen over the creek that offered about three feet of clearance above the hypothermic waters, and I offered to cross first. Straddling this tree, I slide myself over the waters rushing below me. Mistakenly, seeing my pocket knife fall out of my pocket into those same waters. A mild inconvenience in any other situation would be the loss of a necessary tool for getting out of this occasion. I cross the river choosing that creek bed to be the resting place for the knife. Josiah crosses after, clumsilier than myself. His foot dips slightly into the creek, dampening his sock. Our time to now get into the car is now cut into minutes, if we do not get his foot warmed. We sit down, take his boots off, take off his socks, and the cold winter and snow must have felt like knives against his skin. With our reduced movement of our cold fingers, I'm helping him find a fresh pair of socks in my pack, as he was wearing his last two pairs. Socks are something I always bring in quantity on these trips. I find the socks. Josiah puts them on, struggles to put on his boot, and we eventually begin our voyage again. We traverse the last few miles of the wilderness and make our way back to the SUV. At this point, we are nearly running towards the vehicle. There are five inches of snow. I unlock the door, dump our packs in the back, and turn the key. The car revs and the sound of the engine roaring over the snow was like the cries of victory we deserved. We kept the car in park, pushed on the gas to rev the engine up to about 2,000, heating up the cabin for the two of us. We could finally feel our fingers and our toes. Driving back over the mountain, listening to the radio weather forecasts, mocking us by their explanations of how serious this unforeseen storm is, and that school districts all over the county are already closing for the following Monday. We get back to my farmhouse, heat up coffee, make eggs, and laugh about how we nearly perished twice in the last 48 hours. After breakfast, after nearly dying, Josiah drives home. Camping is about challenging yourself and reconnecting to what mankind once was, with some added amenities. That trip was far more than the challenge either of us had in mind, but it added confidence to our ability to work together in bad situations. I went camping with my city slicker fiancé now wife. She had never been camping before. A day or two before we left, I bought my first pistol. This was around 1999. We went to Woods Canyon Lake in April at the start of the season to avoid the crush of people. It's a man-made lake. The campground was well-developed and park-like. I normally like a more secluded spot, but my fiancé was not looking to have a Jason Voorhees camping experience. We arrived late Friday night around 11. My old beta car was having trouble due to the thinner air. I hadn't stopped to adjust the carb in Payson. We select a spot and quietly try to set up. It was quiet. Most people never understand when you say that, but it was so quiet it was loud. 
There were a few occupied campsites a few hundred yards away, and you could hear people breathing and snoring. It was very dark. There was no moon or light pollution. Our lanterns cast a feeble glow, and it seemed like they barely pushed back the night. We must have sounded like a troop of elephants trying to get our tiny tent set up. We went to bed right away because we had worked all day then drove up from Phoenix without rest. My first screw up was not realizing how cold it got at night and making sure our gear was good enough. We woke up so cold at 3am, shivering very hard we couldn't even light a match. I finally got the propane heater going on her tent and covered her with my sleeping bag and blanket so she wouldn't die. I lit it and sat by the fire to get warm and drank coffee until the sun came up. I didn't notice anything odd except the unnatural quiet. No animal sounds or anything. The hiss of my stove as the coffee perked sounded like a jet engine. The next day was nice. We did stuff like fishing and rode a boat around the lake. Looking back, the entire north side of the lake was filled with weird tree structures. There's no easy access to that side of the lake. I felt uneasy, rowing so close to the shore on that side for some reason. The day ended with us exhausted and sunburned. A good day. I made a dinner of soup and boiled eggs on the camp stove at sunset. We had recently watched the Blair Witch Project, and I bought her the same hat the girl had. A powder blue stocking cap. We had an old school HI8 video camera and made some parody videos while the food cooked. Hilarious. I drank a few beers and we ate. We put the fire out and headed to our tent for some rest. We had decided to sleep with our bags zipped together to share body heat. A smart choice. She fell asleep right away. For some reason I didn't get sleepy in the woods. Never have. I stayed up reading with a flashlight. We left one lantern burning low off to the left side of the tent. There was a camp far off to our right, and this night they left a lantern on as well. I leave a lantern on because I'm paranoid and want to see the silhouette of something if it enters my camp on the tent wall. I had my new firearm next to me, a 9mm Lawson. It's the worst gun I've ever owned, but it was cheap for a couple of poor kids just starting out. I'm reading something by Dean Kuntz when I notice something. It was quiet dead quiet. I listened hard. All I could hear was the hiss of the lantern, my own breathing, and my tinnitus. What caught my attention? I couldn't sense anything, so I went back to reading. A few minutes later, I felt the same thing. There were bears. We had cleaned up dinner and put all food in the food trash in the car. Was it a bear? I briefly heard a baby fussing up north and a mama soothing it. There was another camp about 300 yards north of us that had a baby. That is how quiet it was. That's when I noticed something. Something was pressing lightly against the top of a small frame tent over my head near the peak on the right side. Was it a branch? No, there were no branches in reach because people broke them off for firewood. There was no undergrowth or bushes in the entire site. So what was pushing against my tent? I stayed calm and quiet and watched the spot. It started moving slowly down towards my face. My hand crept slowly for my handgun. It didn't have a shape like a finger or a hand. I could hear it sliding down the cheap single layer of green nylon fabric with a low hiss. With my flashlight on, I could not see light from my lantern or the other campers. I didn't want to douse my light and alert whoever it was that I detected they were doing that. At this point, I was sure it was a person. My wife was, and still is, a very beautiful young woman. She was a perv magnet, with her long, luxurious blonde hair and slim figure. My hand wrapping around the grip of my 9mm as I pretended to be getting comfortable. I even sighed. Well, this perv was about to have the scare of his life. The plan was to bark out at him and cock the gun and then burst out the tent when I heard him run away and fire a few rounds into the woods or follow him to his camp. In a smoothish motion, I pulled the side back on the gun and pressed it into the depression in the tent fabric. I felt resistance. Something was there. You're messing with the wrong people, friend, I said, or something equally one-linerish. I expected to hear a gasp or a curse or something. 
but I heard nothing. The resistance faded as whatever it was backed off, still without a sound. A mouse farting would have sounded like a cannon, it was so quiet. I killed my light. The light from the distant lanterns illuminated the right side of my tent with a pale glow. It was clear, not even blocked by a tree or branch. I whipped my head to the left, thinking I would see a skulking shadow on that side from my lantern, but it was also clear. I laid there for many long minutes, straining to hear something, but there wasn't even a breath of wind or a cricket chirping. I decided to stay in the tent and not investigate. I didn't get any sleep that night. I laid there on high alert, with my weapon on my chest, listening. Finally, about an hour before dawn, the crickets started chirping along with the birds. I didn't get out of the tent until I heard the other campers stirring. I checked the entire campsite, but found no print other than ours. No animal tracks, no scat, no sign that anyone but us had been there. So I know about weird stuff that goes on in that area. Turns out there have been Bigfoot sightings near the campground. We had fun that day, starting with a hearty breakfast of bacon and eggs. I didn't mention what happened to my fiancé until later, when we got home. She thought I'd want to stay another night because we had Monday off from work, but I told her that I was tired. We broke camp around 4pm, and were on the road home before sunset. What was touching my tent? Who knows? Whatever it was could move in near total silence. It was cautiously respectful of a firearm, but not afraid. It could move and navigate in almost total darkness, and left no trace. I have camped in that area twice since then, but not in the last 15 years or so. Nothing strange happened on those trips except to reinforce the strangeness of that first trip. The nights were always filled with noise, insects, and animals. Hell, one time we even got chased into a tent early by a curious skunk coming around. Anyway, that's my weirdest experience, but not my only one. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs except the back end of it. It borders on a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friend and I would play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like a very overgrown dozer track. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central slash eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We'd probably made a mile of progress in this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say it was a pond, because it was perfectly round like a crater. The water had obviously receded, and in the middle was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next to door, a full car door half buried under pine duff, riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the south, go out, have a few beers with your buddies, and shoot some more junk. But what we found next was not a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. Bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side, not sure what our objective was, to make a museum of quality deer skeleton or what. But that's what we did. Then the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately because my uncle was a chiropractor and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would look at. The more I started looking at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got a gut feeling, and being the oldest I told everyone to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone. We hiked back the way we came, and went back to the pool down the road and finished out for the day but I couldn't stop thinking about the bones. That night I told my mum about what we found, and I had to tell dad the story. At first they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors going back and forth. The next day I told the story to two sheriff deputies and took them to the area where we'd entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles hacking the tiny dead end 
leading off into the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush and men in white suits and detective badges smoked cigarettes and spoke amongst each other as other men carried bags from the forest and put them in vehicles. And they were gone. I waited months to hear something, but heard nothing. I asked my parents what happened, and if they figured it out. Over time, their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually, I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I was home from college and sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything. We started talking about it and after a few beers, got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. To this day, they are all adamant. It never happened. But we are adamant. It did. Are people trying to cover something up? So, as skeptical as I am about anything paranormal, with my logic being that just because science can't explain it yet, doesn't mean it's not creepy as hell. But some memories from my childhood are really starting to bother me. It was around 20 years ago. I grew up next to a very creepy 400 acre forested area in the middle of Tennessee, USA. Apparently, it used to belong to a family of freed slaves, way back when, which is now still owned and undeveloped, except for some really old dilapidated and decomposing structures sporadically scattered across it from when it was occupied by the original family. My brothers and I used to go hiking in the woods and found these places, but we stopped because, well, that part comes later. For some clarity, I mean an old farmhouse, smokehouse, and on the border of the property line in the wooded area behind my old house was a rickety old house. Think little house on the prairie or old Amish style, and you get the picture. If you go ahead and age it, an extra 150 years. So my old house, which was on kind of an elevation, with the backyard sloping to the wooded property line, bordered said creepy 300 acre wood. The neighborhood I was in was basically bordering the forest along this property line, with the house facing the street, with the backyards bordering the forest line, that was demarked by a solid line of underbrush and very mature trees. So the memories and why I'm here. The first memory I have still creeps me out. So mind you, there are no roads, no inhabited houses, nothing built or done to this area because of land division dispute and some will slash deed problems with the family who owns the land. And apparently it's been this way for over 150 years, just forest. My sister and I were out playing in our backyard near the property line where the creepy ass falling down little prairie looking house was when she spotted an old woman in the house. The front of the house was broken down and you could clearly see into it. It had two stories, kind of like a cutaway from a dollhouse where you could take off the front and see all the rooms. Allegedly, this 70 to 80 year old woman was just sitting in a green lawn chair watching us from the second story loft. We were young, maybe eight. We didn't really notice some of the more peculiar aspects of this scene. We'd been playing for a few hours and would have seen someone walk by carrying a green lawn chair because we had a clear view of the house and you couldn't really get it to it unless you either came from our yard or you hiked through a lot of wood. An elderly woman dragging a lawn chair up a rotted out ladder to the second story of a rotted out loft and just chilling there watching me and my sister. So of course my sister goes and says hi, finds out she speaks and said she used to live in that house a long time ago. She looked fairly normal for an old person, but the face was indistinct to me, like I couldn't really get a solid look at it for some reason. I got uncomfortable and said bye to the creepy old lady 
and left, where I basically grabbed my sister and we returned to the house. Now this bothers me, because no one has lived or been living in this area for nearly 150 years. No one could have, or should have been living there. There were no records of it or anything. Also, I knew for a fact that there is no road nor trail or anything that goes to the old house. Even now, thanks to Google Earth. So how did this old woman just appear and disappear? Because as we were walking back to the house, I glanced back at the property line about 80 yards back to the old house and the green chair, which was still there. But the old lady was gone. She didn't pass by us. Didn't hear her climb down. Nothing. Clear line of sight. Early afternoon, not overcast, very well lit. She was simply gone. I did some research from when I had to sell stuff next door for school and couldn't find a similar person on my street or the next or even in the neighborhood. So to this day, I still have no clue what happened there. A second memory. This happened a few times in middle school, but sometimes when I was walking home from the bus stop at the end of the street. The tree line and underbrush along the backyards of the house that bordered the creepy forest started to have glowing red dots in sporadic clusters and resembled to me eyes like tiny orbs of red dull light that appeared along the underbrush and followed me home. I thought it was maybe berries, but no. I hiked through that area with my brothers, no berries or red anything, ever, not holly, or seasonal fruiting bushes or animals, because we had some foxes, deer, and squirrels. That's about it. I couldn't explain it, then nor now. I just remember running home whenever I saw the lights in the underbrush, along the tree line, and would hide in my house as fast as I could. The one time I was brave enough to go up to the bushes, the lights disappeared before I even got close. No sound, no wind, nothing but a cold chill. Which at the time was weird, as it was late spring or early autumn in Tennessee when it happened to me. And it stays pretty damn warm usually. I couldn't ever find any evidence as to what it was. No red berries or critters, or some wackadoo raving around red Christmas lights. Yet, this memory still gets to me. My third memory. Why do I feel like I'm being watched? So my old house was old. Well, 30 years or so. Never really got the cold spots or the other classic signs that someone's making up stuff about having a paranormal encounter. But every now and then when I was alone, maybe the basement usually, or occasionally outside in the woods, I got the sensation someone or something else was there. And every time before I felt the sensation, I started to get afraid a little first, then full on mad dash away in full adrenaline mode whenever I realized what I was feeling. This happened more than I liked. I hated it and thought I was losing my mind. Mind you, I didn't do any drugs, prescribed or otherwise, and even didn't start drinking till college. I couldn't explain it, and it didn't fit panic attack symptoms or anything similar. I've been checked out and looked at, examined my medical records, but couldn't find anything from a biological perspective. There are a few more jarring experiences as well that happened to me. And I'm gonna share these with you now. There was another occasion where I was tromping around the woods and felt like I was being forcibly turned around. My brother and I spent a good deal of our first five to seven years at that house going in the forest, hiking around with no problems, usually, or how we all just stopped when we got close to high school age. And I chalked it up to us having other things to do, girls, sports, friends. Then I remembered arguably our last trip and my second to last trip into that forest. My last trip made me never go into those woods again. Thinking back, maybe there's a reason why no one wants to develop the woods or why the owners won't sell to anyone. I even checked. Even if the forest is prime real estate South Nashville worth millions of dollars, probably because we were kids or something, 
If we felt uncomfortable, we just didn't talk about it and cut trips short, so we ignored things. Except this trip, that turned out to be our last group outing into the damn forest, because we were old enough to start knowing when things simply aren't right. Thinking back on those details through meditation, and sorting through details with my brother, who didn't want to recall anything, seems like we made a conscientious decision to never speak of it again. Except, I wanted answers. And here's the story. So, usual gorgeous late spring Tennessee weather, that begs you to get outside and go for a hike into nature. My brother and I gear up for a Saturday excursion into the woods to explore past the old ruined smokehouse to the left side of the woods. We trek through the back of our property line into the woods proper, trekking a straight line using our compasses to go to the circular clearing of protruding limestone. As we got closer, it got quiet, almost silent except for us trailblazing. We get to the clearing, and my two brothers in front of me stop and look at the centre of the stone clearing, where a raised circle outcropping of rock is about 150 feet. I can't really see much at the time, because I was still four foot nothing, and behind those behemoths I call family. We didn't even notice some important details at first. Like how quiet it was, there being no flies or anything around. Or the wax stripping around the center stone circle, making an odd star-shaped pattern. And that it feels like we're being watched, where the back of your neck hair has gone up, and you expect to turn around and see someone. My oldest brother goes up to the circle and just says, Oh crap. I don't have a word, and my second brother starts to notice some of the weirdness about the outer part of the circle, and goes to look. I being the smallest am curious, as all get out and go wander over to the middle where my oldest brother has gone a bit pale, and is staring at something. I look past my older brother's shoulder, and see on the top of the stone dies a lump of stuff. It is a disemboweled animal arranged strangely. But it wasn't eaten at all, and appeared to be a fox. I remember thinking it was strange because I couldn't smell it, and there were no flies or anything or signs it had been bitten open, just splayed there with its organs somehow around it, like a dissection. At this time, everyone started to notice everything else I mentioned. When we confirmed it was more than just one of us feeling like that, we started to hear what sounded like the wind through the trees, but nothing was moving. Not the grass, the plants, and the treetops, which we all knew to look at to figure out the wind direction. Then my eldest brother said, We're going back right now, in a serious tone that I'd never heard him use before. So we all collectively buggered out and went back to the house as fast as we could. I overheard my older brother talking about sacrifice, and that we're not going back, and to tell mom, dad, and the police. I was 12, so I didn't think much of it and was more concerned with hanging out with my friends later in the day. I couldn't just focus on the memories, or I didn't want to think about it. The last time in those woods for me was this memory. Fast forward two to three months, and I'm doing a small hike through the woods alone, maybe 400 meters back from the tree line that borders the neighborhood. I wanted to move parallel to the road so I could get back easily by cutting out a right angle and walking back on the street to my house. Ten minutes into this, I start to turn right to go towards the street to get back in time to leave for the beach vacation with my mum and sister. That's when I felt it the most uncomfortable and awful sensation I've ever felt in those woods. It was like I was being watched coldly, and it was getting closer. I never scared or spooked easily as a kid, and especially in woods. My background is important, as I was basically in various national parks every other weekend camping with my scout troop. I've been through solo orienteering courses day and night in all seasons to earn merit badges, and I don't freak out then, and when I was younger. 
but this time I was spooked hard. I turned around and looked everywhere around me. It was very quiet, too quiet for Tennessee woods. If you've ever been to the southeastern US in summer, go anywhere near nature. You'll understand what I mean when I say it's never quiet. I yelled out tentatively, thinking it could be another person. God, I was hoping it was a person. Then it just got silent. And no, not any normal silence. Like the kind where you can hear your own breathing. I freak out and bolt out those woods as fast as I can and ended up getting the worst case of poison ivy in my life and had to be sedated and put on steroids. I never went back to those woods after that. I do mineral exploration in Alaska. I'm often transported by helicopter to remote regions throughout the already remote state. A few years ago, my field partner and I came across what seemed like a bear kill of a caribou carcass. But when we got closer, it seemed odd. The only thing that remained were two spines and one head. The head was arranged such that the mouth was wide open, pointing up like it was screaming towards the heavens. The eyes were cut out. Very weird. There's also been many instances of coming across old minor buildings littered with dog skeletons, or having strangely new children's clothes thrown about. After years of hearing other people's encounters and experiences, I have decided to share with you one of my many personal experiences in the area in which I live. Some background before we start. I live in the most northern part of Norway, which is also the most northern part of Europe. My home lies well above the Arctic Circle. This means, for those of you unaware, that we have very short summers, where the sun never sets, and very long winters, when the sun never rises. Those long and cold months of darkness, in the end and beginning of the year, have made us into, understandably, a superstitious bunch. There are many tales meant to safeguard us growing up. You have Stalo, the mountain troll who steals children who wander too far from their home. You have Mai Ling, who you will not see, but you can hear it stalk you, letting out the cries of a baby. And the Nook, who lies in waiting beneath the surface of lakes and rivers, waiting to drown unsuspecting swimmers. My story begins when I was 16. I had just gotten my hunting license and my father had even bought me a shotgun for my birthday. This was a big deal for me, as I had always followed my father on hunting trips as a child, but never had I actually shot grouse myself. My father is the stereotypical northern Norwegian. He knows everything about the outdoors and he can endure any hardship or weather with the same unwavering sense of macabre humor. Once his fingers got stuck in a saw at his workplace, and he peeled the skin off his middle finger like a banana peel. He promptly bandaged it up by himself and kept going. He did not consider going to the doctors to get it looked at before almost two weeks had passed, and the stench of bandages made him unbearable to stay in close proximity with. In the end, he needed a skin transplant, and several weeks off work before his hand was remotely usable again. So the time of year comes when the sun is out for a few hours in the morning, and me and my dad take the journey to the cabin. This includes an hour of driving and a further hour of boat. You see, our cabin is in a remote area without any road access, so the only way to get there is by a ferry. This means we somewhat already know who is out there, since most people only stay over the weekend and there are no holidays and the ferry only goes Fridays and Sundays during the weekend. That being said, there are never any more than a handful of people out there at the same time, spread out on an area that is roughly larger than my hometown. This time, on the other hand, it was only me and my father taking the ferry that Friday, so I knew we were going to be alone for the weekend. Arriving on that small pier by the cabin, I could finally breathe in the fresh air of untouched nature that has always been soothing to my soul. It's like you leave behind all your troubles at home, because out here, they are irrelevant. At the cabin, the only things that mattered 
is the things to keep you safe and warm and fed. We dug out our snowmobile that was parked near the pier and drove the short trip over to the cabin. That night, we mostly spent preparing noose traps and lunch for the next day. My father told me old stories of when he went hunting back in the days and such, and we shared in ceremonial hunter shot of a single malt whiskey. I slept well that night as I normally do in the peace and quiet of the cabin. We got out of the cabin late following morning, due to us just enjoying the calming of a morning with no obligation. This would turn out to be a mistake, however. You see, the key point is to be out early so that you can utilize the sunlight as much as possible. We knew this, but sometimes you just want to sit down and eat a lazy breakfast and watch morning TV. When we had arrived at the Lavu, imagine a winter version of a TP, that we had set up the summer next to our lake, which was now frozen, of course. My father decided that he would take it easy that day and get the Lavu warmed up so that when I returned from the mountain, there would be warm food and drink waiting for me. I had previously spent a lot of time by myself around the area, so walking around the mountain alone never bothered me and still does not to this day. So I started walking up the mountain overlooking the lake. It was difficult due to the heavy snow and me not bringing my skis. Instead, I opted for using an old pair of snowshoes that were hanging in the cabin. This resulted in me using way more time than I needed to get up to where I could find some grouse that I may shoot, as I knew from previous experiences that this was the area they would be in. After a lot of effort, I made it up, and despite being full of tracks and feces, it was abandoned. You see, it had snowed that night, and part of the morning, so the tracks must have been somewhat fresh, yet I could not see nor hear anything. So I stalked the forest upon the mountain for hours without any traces of life. That's when I noticed the silence. It's like what people with similar experiences say. There is always a deafening silence that preludes something bad. Like all the animals know it's time to get out of there and do just that. I remembered for the first time since childhood that I felt uneasy about being alone up there. But of course, I was not about to go empty-handed back to my father, so I continued. As I was walking around, I listened intently to any sound that might give away any other form of life. I remember being amazed at how loud my footsteps were. At this point, I was a tall yet skinny boy, even though I walked as slow and controlled as humanly possible. The uneasy feeling creeping closer and closer to the point where I decided to take a quick snack break and regain my previous calm state of mind. As I walked back to a clearing overlooking the lake, my footsteps seemed to almost lighten as I felt more relaxed and at ease again. I sat down on a rock and ate a bar of chocolate that I had bought and enjoyed the sun on my face, ridiculing myself for being spooked of what essentially was nothing. That's when I heard footsteps coming from the direction I had just been in. Loud and heavy footsteps of a grown man. I knew this because as anyone can tell you, the sound of a biped walking on two feet is quite distinct from four-legged creatures such as moose or bears, especially in heavy snow. I tried calling out because I immediately thought it was my father who had a change of heart, but there was no reply. I sat there on the rock, watching the direction of the footsteps as they grew louder and louder. Several times I called out, and yet I received no reply. Feeling uneasy again, I decided to take out my phone and try to call my father. There on my phone, I had an unread message from my father delivered three minutes ago. Coffee and lunch are ready. Simultaneously, the footsteps were somehow getting louder and louder and I knew whatever was at the other end was not my father. This, and knowing that we were supposed to be the only two people in my radius for many, many kilometers, made me instantly jump up. I grabbed my shotgun and noped out of there as soon as I had tightened my snowshoes. As I was making my way, with all the haste I could muster, I heard whatever it was stalking me pick up the pace and I realized that the sound of my own two footsteps and whatever it was that was after me were almost in sync to the point where there was only a slight difference when our feet hit the ground. 
I realized since then that whatever it was had followed me since I had entered the forest on the mountain and was the cause of why I felt my footsteps were abnormally loud. I remember trying my best to run in hip-deep snow, not caring about the thick layer of branches that hit my cold face, leaving red marks all over. It came to the point where I could hear the extra pair of footprints, no more than five meters behind me. Yet when I turned around, there was nothing. I pushed all I had in me, and I finally managed to reach the frozen lake on the other side from the lava, and the extra pair of footsteps stopped. Exhausted by the kilometers plus that I ran, in high snow, I made my way to the lavu. My father seemed almost amused by how tired I seemed. He handed me a hot cup of coffee and asked if I saw anything. I didn't know what to say, and was honestly embarrassed by what had occurred, so I only said that I had spotted many tracks, but alas, no birds. However, in later years, I asked him about this and other strange occurrences around the area and the answers have always been roughly the same. Don't worry about it. Don't ask about it. Some things are better off ignored. I was about 14 years old when my dad went away on business for a few weeks, leaving me to tend to the farm by myself, mostly just feeding horses and chickens. Not a big deal. The farm was way outside of town and down a dirt road the nearest neighbors were two pastures away, and my dad insisting on never locking the doors. The farm was always seriously eerie in the mornings. After the first few nights, I started hearing tapping on the windows late at night. So I obviously broke dad's rules and started locking the front and back doors. Then the window tapping advanced to doorknob rattling. And then I started finding odd things around the farm while doing the chores. One morning, I found the horses stuffing themselves in all the hay storage stall. The latch for that stall was very stiff and a little complicated, so it had obviously been opened by a person, not the horses. The worst morning I stepped out onto the back porch to find all the chickens sitting in a row along the side of a shed, evenly spaced, with their necks broken. One or two of them were still moving a bit. They looked set out on display. The chicken yard latch had obviously been opened by a person and left open. The worst part was when my dad finally came home, he blamed me for every bit of the oddness and disaster and acted like I was stupid for being scared. He insisted that the horses open the hay latch and that the dogs were responsible for opening the chicken yard and the line of poised, broken necked chickens. I think it's worth mentioning that our next door neighbor was well known for being absolutely mental. Documented bits of crazy that my dad was entirely aware of included putting bear traps in his haystacks to catch the kids who had been playing with it and blocking off a neighbor's driveway with a load of dirt as revenge for not letting him ride his horses on their property. So my guess is that our neighbor knew that my dad was gone because his vehicle wasn't present could hear my music turned up in the distance across the pastures and figured terrorizing a middle school girl would be a fun hobby for a few weeks. I grew up in the Midwest US. When I was a junior in high school, I was out for a hike at a local trail in the National Forest. This was a good 20 miles from town, way out in the sticks. It's a box canyon, so you start at the rim and hike down into the canyon. It was autumn and late afternoon when I pulled into the empty parking area, but there was plenty of light. By the time I got to the bottom of the canyon, the sun was getting pretty low. I was down in the canyon and got that feeling that something wasn't quite right. I started looking behind me as I walked every few steps. I just couldn't shake this feeling. Finally, on one of these backward glances, I spotted a man peeking out from behind a tree. Not far at all, maybe a hundred feet. It was the weirdest thing to catch a guy watching me. He knew I'd seen him and stepped out saying, sorry, I didn't want to scare you. He was an adult man and I was a scrawny 17 year old kid. We were on the trail in a public park 
There was no reason to hide. I wouldn't have been surprised nor alarmed to see another hiker unless they were acting like a weirdo. I mumbled something about getting back to my car and started heading back towards the parking area, leaving him standing there. As soon as I was out of view, I ran all the way back. There were no other cars other than mine, which only added further to the weirdness. I realize it's entirely likely that he was on foot and possibly lived near the trailhead, as there were houses out there. But it's interesting how you get that sense that you're being watched, and it often turns out to be true. If you see someone hiking alone, try not to be a creep. Last year, from January to July, I dated a guy called Lucas. He loved the paranormal more than I did. He's also a firm believer, while I tend to be more skeptical. I firmly believe in angels and demons, but are kind of iffy on the topic of ghosts due to my more religious upbringing, whereas he comes from a small town steeped in superstition, where I came from a big city, where we had so much going on to even consider the afterlife. We met during my freshman year of college. He attended the community college and I attended the major university. My roommate and I got bored one night and had downloaded Tinder more as a joke than anything else. Nevertheless, I matched with Lucas and he was eager to meet and could hold a conversation and I decided, why not? We met at the local barbecue place right off my campus and spoke for hours. Towards the end, he asked me, do you believe in ghosts? I felt like this could be a trap. What if I say yes and he thinks I'm crazy? I told him I wasn't really sure but was open to the notion. He told me he could turn me into a believer. I was like, bet. And we decided one day he'd take me to the local ghost tour. He was a native of my small college town. He knew every superstition, every back road, and he knew stories only locals knew. The stuff you can't really find online. We kind of fell off when I went home that summer. We had something happen to us a week prior to the semester ending. We almost died and kind of wanted to be alone to process it. That's a story for another time. Fast forward to November of my sophomore year. He randomly sent me a friend request on Facebook and I accepted and we started chatting via the messenger. We get back on the topic of the paranormal and I asked, Hey, do you remember the night we almost died? He replied that he does. I told him I wanted to go back to the spot, a cemetery, where we had something freaky happen. We were actually on a ghost hunt then, and I was super casual about it all, as I was 100% convinced nothing would happen. Hell no, I didn't want to go back there, I almost died, he said. But I can show you the bridge. It's haunted, he goes. He picks me up from my old dorm, and we set out for the bridge. It took us about 20 minutes to get there. It was up in the mountains, and there weren't any street lights of any kind. The bridge stretched over this creek, and there are woods all around the bridge. Middle of nowhere, literally. We exit his truck with flashlights and go to stand on the bridge. I ask him to tell me the story as to why it's haunted. He goes on to tell me that back in the 1960s, there lived a doctor called Dr. Gary. He was a rural mountain doctor and would take house calls. He was heading home one night. It was later than usual. He was exhausted and overworked and came down the mountain flying towards the bridge. As he was about to cross it, he had a heart attack and lost control of his small car. His car swerved across the bridge, hitting the side three times before flipping over into the creek below. Obviously, he passed away. It is said that every night Dr. Gary relives his death and drives across the bridge every night before splashing into the creek. You'll hear a loud BAM as his car hits the side, and then twice more before a splash. Before that, you'll see his 1960s car coming around the bend. Lucas has a large group of guy friends, and several of them aren't believers. He took them to the bridge to wait for Dr. Gary, and they're all standing under the bridge when they heard the bam, bam, bam. It scared them so much, they refused to go back. I was living for this, and was so pumped to witness this, 
We got there at 11 and according to Lucas's dad, that's when Dr. Gary comes. Lucas was steadfast it would happen. I yelled, hey, Dr. Gary, I don't believe you exist. Show yourself. We waited for over an hour and nothing happened. Lucas was dumbfounded. We left and decided to try again the next night. For three nights, nothing happened. On the fourth night, we decided to go earlier. I had a test the next day and didn't want to be out late. We arrived at 9 p.m. Lucas asked me if I wanted to see the creek below the bridge. There are these stone steps you can go down and explore underneath. I was apprehensive and feared homeless people slumbering below or creeps waiting for easy targets to wander into their den. But still we headed down the steps when I heard people talking. They sounded young, maybe my age. I was 20 at the time and figured we shouldn't go down there, but Lucas looked at me like I was crazy. He couldn't hear the people talking. It was so loud. There were at least four of them and he shined his light below and shook his head. Megan, there's no one down there, he said. He left me and went down the stairs and I didn't want to be alone, so followed him. He was right. There was no one down there, but I knew I heard people clear as day. They were laughing. I could even tell some were male and others female. I was beyond confused. He was explaining to me how he and his friends liked to drink beer underneath the bridge when we heard a car coming. Because we were in an isolated place, we didn't hear cars pass by much. You'd only have about one or two an hour. I was like, oh, a car's driving above us. When all of a sudden we heard the bam, 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 followed by a splash. It was so intense, the whole bridge was vibrating. And I'm like, crap. We sprint up the stairs and get in his truck. I honestly have no clue what would cause that. We didn't bail out and stuck around and ghost hunted. I had an EVP recorder and ghost detector device and got them out to see if I could speak with Dr. Gary. What happened with that I'll share for another time. I'd love to hear what you all have to say. I am now firmly a believer in him. After the bridge thing, the activity ramped up big time. All the nights before that were calm. Not this one. This didn't happen to me, but my boyfriend and his cousin. They were 17 and driving down this really dark road in a southwestern part of Arizona. It's a long stretch of road that was well known for not having any street lights, and it was surrounded by the local farmer's field. It had a huge canal that ran along the side of the street. There was also a very small town that connected to the west side of the streets to the south side of the streets, and it was named Santa Maria. Now my husband and I, who were both born and raised in Arizona, grew up close to this area. We'd heard about all the crazy stories and strange happenings, but crazy stories is all that we believed them to be. Especially because we drove up and down through this street almost every day, definitely every weekend, and always with our family as youngsters, then as teenagers looking for a spot to party, or make out at. So with that being said, I just want to say I don't condone underage drinking. We were young and dumb, but now I'm a mum. Anyway, on this night, my boyfriend and his cousin were sober. They had just left the south side and were now heading home. They were on the 67th Avenue and Lower Buckeye going west to 75th and Thomas Road when the car in front of them swerved crazily and there wasn't any heavy traffic, but there was a car in front of them and one in the back. When the car in front of them swerved to the right, this is what they described. A lady in a white gown and a veil with no face was floating towards them. The cousin screamed to hit it. My boyfriend hit the gas fast, swerving to the right, causing them to almost crash into the canal. Neither of them looked back behind them into the mirrors. Then they sped all the way home, not saying a word. When they pulled into the driveway, his cousin jumped out the truck and ran inside, leaving him behind and the passenger door swung wide open before he even put the truck in park. My boyfriend then ran inside too, frightened by what he'd just seen. 
They were both too scared to go out and check the bed of the truck, or even go to close the door. To better understand, where we live there have been accounts of people seeing La Llorona, which is apparently what they think they've seen. Bear in mind I've been married to this man for over 20 years, he's a straight up guy, and has only shared this story with me on several occasions. Each time I curiously ask what I think he saw, and he stares at me quietly and says, while well, she was floating, because I didn't see her feet, which then tells me she probably wasn't human. I just want to let you know these guys aren't remotely cowardly, but something on that road scared the hell out of them. My friends and I liked to night climb. We lived in the middle of a desert. One day we decided to go venture into an area we hadn't been before, but was public land. There are a lot of random dirt trails. We drove around for a while until we found a great canyon. The moon was full and lit up the desert. It was serene and beautiful, until it became time to leave. Mind you, there are no other lights other than the moonlight, my headlights, and soon the headlights of a bread truck. It came down one of the random little trails hauling us, and stopped dead in its tracks when I'm assuming it saw us. It sort of just rumbled there idle for a minute or two, and we just stood at the back of my SUV and peeked around to see if anyone was going to get out. Nope. They just sat there waiting, and waiting, and waiting. After a few minutes of this I got weirded out, and decided we should leave. We piled into my SUV and started driving in the opposite direction of the trail. The guy turned around, that bread truck, and started following us. I don't know if any of you have driven down a desert trail at night that isn't monitored, but it gets creepy. The bread truck was flying down the trail after us. I would turn down random trails trying to get away from it, going over the crest of a hill, but there it was, right behind us. We drove around for a good half hour or so with this truck just following us. Finally I was able to get onto the highway and speed off. Unfortunately for me, it didn't follow. I used to own a horse boarding and training farm, with about 45 acres surrounded by woods. I used to spend the night there quite a bit, because I had to start chores early in the morning. So if I stayed up too late, it wasn't worth it to drive home. One night at about midnight, my dog started to bristle up and growl at the door of the office I slept in, and then my iPod, which I kept on a speaker in the middle of the barn, started blasting out Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire at full volume, which I definitely had not left on. Let me tell you that song is freaky as hell in the middle of the night like wet your pants freaky. My dog was full on growling and barking at the door, so I cracked it to let him run out, figuring that if someone were in or around the barn, he'd get them. Anyone there would have had to have been trespassing at that time of night. After a few minutes I went out of the office into the barn aisle, with the bat, to turn off the creepy music. The light I usually kept on so that I could see around was off, so it was pitch black in most of the barn. My dog was staring out the barn door, which I kept open in the summer to keep the horses cooler, as his hair bristled, but wasn't leaving the barn, which he was allowed to do. I wrote it off as creepy as hell, but ultimately just was one of those things. You know, like it's weird and I can't explain it, but there's got to be a rational explanation that I simply don't know what it is. But the real scary part is that my property shared a private gate in the back with the property closest to mine, which had a gate at the back. Most of my property was fenced because of the horses, and the property next to mine was dozens of acres fenced with a chain link fence, which if you know anything about rural fencing is not done. Anyway, we found out later that the owner of the adjoining property was Todd Colap, the South 
Carolina serial killer. He had a woman chained up like a dog on his property, who he and his friends would abuse and walk around the property on a leash. He also had some of the remains of the people he buried on his property. He was doing all that stuff while I lived next to him. In fact, I used to ride on his property, but would always turn around if I heard machinery. In retrospect, it was probably burying things, or got the creeps, like something would tell me to turn around and go home. I was probably one of the few, if not only person beside his friends, to go on his property while all of that was going on. My name is Luke, and I am now 20 years old. This story happened to me when I was 17. The experience still gives me chills to this day. In May 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was getting bored of cruising around the streets, so I wanted to go for a trail slash woodland bike ride. I've never been to Lee Woods before then. Personally, I don't think I'll be going alone again. After some researching into a few different areas, Lee Woods seemed to me my best bet. Living only a few miles away from it, it was a nice bike ride. Upon arriving, it looked peaceful, and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colours at the start of each trail, signifying difficulty for bikers and length of walkers. Don't take my word on that bit. I still have no clue what it really means. So I decided to go down a blue trail, I believe, to see how it was. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail, and now here's where it starts to get weird. I began having this sort of vision, looking around as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and further away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I actually lost track of time. I got lost on the trail. Now bear in mind I'm very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. I then came to a strange opening. I could go left, in the rough direction of the way out, or right, deeper into the woods. And me being me, elected to go deeper in. I came to a weird little trail that had dodgy written all over it. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was getting more dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down. Then I turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, I just stood still staring down at the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be nearly impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me in the area. I got nervous and began walking back up the hill, as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind my bike tires are completely solid. No punctures, slow punctures, or anything wrong at all. I wish I still had pictures of that bike. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing happened. I felt as if the whole path had stretched by half a mile, as if the woodland were moving. I began walking up the path, feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time, it felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time since I went down that first trail. I'll explain the scenery before continuing. It's a long path, a slight steep hill to my left. A very narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep, and maybe four feet wide. Bushes on the, on the other side of the river, with the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting about a quarter of the way up, the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river and look behind to see if the person is okay, 
also because many people go to Lee Woods to end their lives. So I was hoping to perhaps help this person. But as you guessed, there's no one there. And the crying stopped. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turn away and begin walking again, a bit quicker, as I was unnerved at the time. I've had paranormal experiences before, but not usually in a place like the woods, usually in a house or some sort of building, so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking and maybe a minute or so later, only a few meters away from where I heard the crying, it started again. But this time it was right opposite me and crossed the river. I didn't bother looking. I started to go in a bit of a jog. As I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling, as if it was following me. Upon hearing this, I sped up, and the crying became more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I thought to myself, screw this, I'm gone. I went up on my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, and came to almost a sudden stop. The back tire on my bike had become completely flat. So I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip up or end up having to throw it to run faster. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I'm running faster and faster, praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling that I wanted to cry because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster. And after what felt like an hour, but in reality was probably only five to 10 minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me getting closer and started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing as multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out the car park and ran towards it. While doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother on approaching the car park exit. I couldn't believe it. My bike tire had suddenly regained all its air. It was solid again, as it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped on my bike and got away from Lee Woods as fast as I could, and I've never been back since, as every person I tell this story to becomes reluctant to go there with me, or any extra people. The thing that makes this scary, for me at least, is that I have Irish heritage. In Irish folklore, there is a demon woman called the Banshee. She is seen in woodlands next to rivers and lakes, washing blood off clothes. It is said that if you see her washing blood off clothes, the person who owns these clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death. I can't remember the meaning exactly of the deaths, but it can either mean you or a loved one will pass. Since 2017, I have lost my auntie, two of my best friends, and a dog. Lee Woods are no joke. There are many stories that have come out of Lee Woods too. You can read online about them. Search up Lee Woods Bristol Haunting. It's rated 87th most haunted place in the UK, according to Higgy Pop at least. It's a popular spot in Bristol for people taking their lives or it was at least. Even the ghost of Imsbard Kingdom Brunel has been spotted there looking over the suspension bridge in which he designed. Me and my friend Jacob go out biking in a forest near my house because it's pretty big and has some nice trails. We'd been biking around an hour when we realized we were kind of lost. So we stopped to try and figure out where we were at. He was trying the map app on his phone when I noticed a house not too far off the trail. My friend's phone wasn't having any luck with connecting. So we decided to walk over to the house to check if someone could point us back in the right area. We knocked on the door and like a horror movie, the door creaked open. We walked in to ask if anyone was there and realized the place was empty. It was mostly furbished, but it looked pretty old, and the fridge was rancid. My friend finds a staircase leading up a floor, and we decide to go up and check that part of the place out. The second I put my foot on the staircase, I felt nauseous. I almost fell over because of how bad it felt. My friend helps me walk out the place, but I collapsed outside on the ground and began vomiting. My friend is trying to help me, 
from falling into my vomit. And once I was done, I sat back and tried to get air. That's when my friend turned around and mumbled, Holy crap, dude. I turn around. The entire house is gone. Like, not even there was dirt and stuff that proved the house was there. I mean, it looked like the house had never been there in the first place. There was even a tree growing in a spot where the corner of the place was. I didn't really know what to say. So I just sat there staring at the ground. That's when I realized I had taken a picture of the place on my phone. So I pulled it out, trying to see if I had actually taken a picture or not. It was just a picture of the ground covered in dead leaves and grass. We decided that moving was better than staying there. And after half an hour, we found our way back to the trail we knew. I've got no idea what the hell that was. Has anyone else seen this? I can't be the only one, right? I spent a summer doing conservation work, out in the absolute middle of nowhere. I was part of a crew that would spend two weeks camping in remote places to do manual labor in places machines couldn't get to. We were building a new hiking slash biking trail in the back portion of a designated wilderness area in a high altitude desert. This means that the nearest civilization was a two hour car ride to a town of 41 people in a sandy soil area where tracks last forever. It was in the middle of our stint during the early part of the night, where everyone else had gone to bed. But I stayed up to read. It must have been around 1130 or so, still pitch black outside, with clouds having covered the stars. My headlamp was probably the only light on a 40 mile radius. Suddenly, I hear footsteps walking around our camp and head towards the tents from where I was in the community tent. The sound immediately put me on edge as I felt the hair on my arms raise and my adrenaline spike. I recall thinking to myself that two things are very wrong since the person was not using a light to see and the footsteps were not coming towards me from the tents. Rather, it was the opposite. Within the four seconds it took me to drop my book, get up, and turn the corner of the tent to cast my light on the sleeping tents, the sound had stopped, but I saw tracks in the dirt before me. It looked like they came from one end of camp, looked in my tent, walked through the sleeping tents, and kept going again out of camp. I don't know if I was making too much noise or not by walking around, but the rest of my crew ended up waking up and asking me what was going on from inside their tents. After explaining what I found, they all got up to look at the boot prints in the dirt. They were damn near perfect copies of my own boots, except for one small thing. I had a rock stuck in my treads that were messing up the symmetry. I was wearing fairly common work boots, except I also happened to wear US size 15 double wide. So there's no way in hell this was one of the other crew members. I don't think any of us slept much that night. Never saw or heard anything more after the night. A light rain removed the tracks a few days later, but I do remember none of us were willing to step on the prints themselves and chose to step over them like cracks in the sidewalk. Hiking as there are numerous hiking trails that traverse the entire area, all of which are light hiking slash nature walk sort of trails. It's a popular spot for photographers for shooting portraits, and during hunting season, it's popular for bow hunting. I'm an amateur photographer. I do portraiture for a side gig. I like to fish, and I also like to go hiking. So it's basically one of my favorite places and I go here often. I basically broke into portraiture photography by shooting school photos and couples and such at this location. It has fields with tall grass, great colors in the fall, docks, and easy accessible changes in scenery. It's basically a photographic gold mine. I still do photography, but I'm quite a bit better known at this point 
and obviously significantly better than I was then. But I still use James A. Reed as my go-to location for almost everything. Boy Scout troops also go hiking through the area on nature walks and such. It's just a very popular location. In the summer of 2011, the body of a 19-year-old guy was found at the wildlife park. They call it a wildlife park, but I mean the wildlife amount to deer, fish, and lots of snakes, squirrels, and cranes. I've never really seen anything else there, and I've been there more times than you could ever count. The story of this kid's body was a minor news story, but since I was so familiar with the area, it was of interest to me. The news report was immediately confusing. According to the report, the kid had been partying with some friends, OD'd at the party, and the story breaks apart here. His friends say that he wandered off, and that they didn't know where he went. His mother thinks, for no clear reason, and this is the operating story that the news went with, that he OD'd at this party, and his friends dumped his body in the wildlife area in the middle of the night. Both of these things are pretty much impossible, and I'll explain why right now. The article mentioned which lake his body was found near. It was Bordark Lake, which is pretty much the furthest lake from the entrance to the park that you can get to. Getting to this particular lake requires driving down about a mile and a half long paved road that hasn't seen any service in at least two decades. The thing is riddled with potholes that are car killers. If you don't know where they are, you have to take the road slow. Hitting one of these things in anything short of a full-size pickup will likely destroy your tire and wheel. I've driven it so many times I have the potholes memorized and can drive it pretty normally, weaving in and out of them when they come up. But in the dark of the night, this would be hard, especially for some drunken high teenagers. But that in of itself is an impossible to do. There are three gates between the entrance and where his body was found. One right at the driveway leading to the park, which is one of the large, swinging steel gates. The next gate is just after that. In order to get to Bodark, you need to make an immediate right-hand turn after the visitor center. And that is where you run into the 10-foot chain-link fence that's meant to keep the deer in the wildlife area. The fence runs the entire perimeter of the reserve, as it's right off a highway, and they'll want to make sure the deer stay in there for hunting season. You need to get through a second chained link fence that's chained shut every night. The park opens at sunrise and closes at sunset. After you go through that gate, you get on the previously mentioned paved road for about three minutes and come to what they constitute as the ranger station, but is really just a big parking lot. From here you go through another gigantic fence that is chained link shut. After you're through that gate, you're in the clear to get to Bodark Lake. The trail near Bodark is particularly scenic, and I've used it countless times for photo shoots. It's also a good walk through nature. So the next day my girlfriend and I decide that we would check it out to see if we could find where they found the body. I know, disrespectful, but we were gonna go there anyway, so why not? Well, we did find where they found the body. We know this because the police tape was still there, and it's one hell of a chore. In order to get to where the body was found, you have to start on the trail near Bodark, but about five minutes into the walk, go completely off the path and through the trees and brush, down to an extremely steep slope and go downwards about 20 feet, and cross through the stream at the bottom. The stream was about three to four feet deep, as it was running high through the water and it doesn't move very fast. The only reason we knew where we were going was because the original trail was high enough that we could see through the trees and we caught a glint of the yellow caution tape way in the distance. While hiking, we both wore a pair of Vibram hiking shoes that didn't have any trouble with water. Yes, the ones with toes, but the water was still deep and we didn't particularly want to get swimming. So we walked up steam for quite a while until we found a section that was thin enough to jump across. Mind you, we walked upstream for about 10 minutes before we found this, and then walked back down the stream to where we could have continued in the direction of the caution tape, which we found we could no longer see, even though we were level with it. After a few more minutes of trudging through particularly thick brush and forestry, we finally arrived at the second stream. 
on the other side of which was the roped-off area of police tape. The actual taped-off area was pretty small, so we were able to pretty much tell exactly where the body was found. It was on a pile of rocks right on the other side of the stream. We didn't cross the stream because we'd found it, and that was good enough. There was nothing to see. We'd gone from a class zero nature walk to class two at times class three getting there. There was absolutely no possibility of any amount of drunken teenagers carrying a human body this far into the wilderness in the middle of the night. This is after they'd bypassed the three gates, which were never reported to have been broken into at all. This kid was way off the beaten path and was very literally in the middle of the wilderness. It was so remote that his body was there for a couple of days before anyone found it. I've done a lot of hiking and even completely sober in the middle of the day. This was a serious challenge to get to. It's equally impossible that he just wandered away from some party in the middle of the night and found himself there. There are houses along the highway across from James A. Reed, most of which are farms, and if you go a couple of miles down that highway, you do find a residential area. But the notion that he got messed up, wandered miles down the road, hopped two ten-foot fences, walked a mile down a barely paved road, went into the forest, crossed two deep streams, sat on a pile of rocks and decided to OD in the middle of the forest is equally, if not more, unlikely. So what happened to him? I don't know. I think it's a lot more likely that they went into the forest during operating hours and all started doing drugs in the middle of the forest and left him there where he died. But still. This is a stretch. I cannot stress to you the difficulty of getting to this location. Anyway, so we started our retreat back to the actual trail, climbing through the trees and brush, which was now significantly more difficult because we were going uphill, back to the first stream. And after that, it was a steep incline which was definitely going to require grabbing trees and getting firm footholds, and some teamwork. But before we got that far, we had to trek back upstream to get to the point where we could jump across it. And right here is where things go weird. As we're following the stream up, we stopped dead in our tracks as a middle-aged man in a full business suit was just walking in the stream. He was a tall dude. The water came up right around to his chest. He was in a white dress shirt, a black blazer, black tie, and had a briefcase in his hands that he was kind of letting float behind him. He was walking downstream, so coming directly towards us, but paid us no mind. We both stopped and stared at the guy and then at each other as if to silently say, What the? And both of us backed up as he approached us. He passed us without saying anything or even looking in our direction. He was bald, white, probably around 45 years old and fairly broad. He had a completely brank expression and he looked like he hadn't slept in days. He had massive bags under his eyes which were completely dead. His expression was just dead. Slightly slack-jawed, eyes glossed over. It's worth noting he was dry from the chest up, like he just entered the water and started walking downstream. He was just walking straight down the stream very slowly. We just stood there completely silent, staring at this guy until he passed us by, and we were now looking at the back of his head as he marched forward. He could have easily exited the water at any point, the embankment wasn't difficult, but he just soldiered on down the stream. Now we moved way faster than we safely should have been running up the stream to jump across and get back on the trail into our car, where we drove off and both immediately started asking each other what the hell that was. We tried to tell our friends about the experience, but it was just beyond really conveying how weird it was. I don't even think I can properly put into words to give you the proper context as to how eerie that was. It was just dead silent in the forest, or at least it seems that way. All we heard was him sloshing through the water as he slowly made his way downstream to wherever the hell he was going. I expected to read about another body being found, like this guy was off to off himself in the forest or something, but no such article ever materialised. But the vibe he gave off, like, man, I can't explain the feeling that seeing this guy gave us. It was overwhelming dread, confusion, and terror. I really don't even know how to put into words all the emotions we were feeling, and we both agreed there are no words for it. It was a foreign feeling, and I don't have any other strange experiences other than that. So I'm asking to all of you listeners, what the hell do you think we came across? I know I probably don't need all the backstory to the dead body, 
but it's a weird case that locals generally feel was not sufficiently answered. Because anyone familiar with the area and location will tell you exactly what I just did. Both accounts of how we got there were impossible. So, were the body and the businessman related? Who knows? Did we stumble upon something else while looking for the location? Who or what do you think this dude was? I want to tell you it's just a random guy walking down a stream of disgusting murky water in a business suit because weird things have happened. But I can't shake the feeling that this guy gave off. What do you all think? I live in a small town in South Africa. Near my town, there is a large patch of woods. And since the outbreak of coronavirus, I haven't been in the woods for a long time until yesterday. So my friend called me to ask if I wanted to join him and a few other mates to play a game of paintball in the woods. And obviously I was keen. I got my paintball gear and gun and headed off to my mate's place. There were six of us. Chase, Liam, Matt, Joey, Stephen and me. We headed off to the woods but made a few stops to fill up on petrol and get some gas for the paintball guns. When we finally got to the woods, we parked the cars, got in our gear and ventured out into the forest to find the perfect spot to paintball. Eventually, we got deep enough and to an area with sufficient cover and space to play a good game of capture the flag. We played a couple of games and since it's winter, it got dark really quickly, but we planned for this and brought our flashlights and decided to play a couple of night games, which is extremely hard, especially in the forest we're in. During one match, Joey and I decided to sit out because we were both tired and just needed a quick breather and the others continued to play for a significant good distance away from us. While we're chilling and I was rolling a joint and Joey went to go take a piss a few meters away from me. While I was busy rolling, I had the flashlight pointing towards myself since there were no other lights to allow me to see what I was doing in around me. It was completely dark. I couldn't even see two meters ahead of myself because of how dark it was. Suddenly I heard footsteps coming my way, but thought it was Joey and soon realized I couldn't see any lights from his flashlight. So now, I'm more vigilant, but still relaxed, thinking that he's perhaps trying to play a prank on me or something. But the footsteps stopped a few meters away from me. So I lifted up my flashlight and pointed it in the direction where I heard the footsteps and scanned the area, but saw bushes and trees. And I just thought it might be Joey hiding in the bushes or behind a tree waiting to give me a jump scare. Then I heard footsteps coming in the opposite direction. And when I looked, I could see it was Joey because he was holding his flashlight. That's when I stopped what I was doing and picked up my flashlight and paintball gun. And when Joey reached me, I whispered, bro, I think there's someone over there. And Joey obviously didn't believe me and just said to stop being a baby. But he soon regretted saying that because I decided to do one last scan where I heard the footsteps. And to my horror, I saw someone peeking and staring right at me from behind the tree, 10 to 11 meters away. I shouted, and when Joey heard me, he looked at me and where the man looked and instantly jumped up, picking up his paintball gun. We stared at each other for at least two minutes, but it felt like forever until we stepped out from behind the tree. It was a large man of at least six foot, was filthy. It looked like he hadn't taken a bath in years, wearing baggy ripped up jeans and just an old dirty zipped up bomber jacket. Plus we could see that he was on something or he was just crazy and holding something dark behind his back. What are you guys doing out here when it's so dark? We couldn't even answer him because of the shock. Joey started with fear in his voice. We were just leaving. But the man nodded his head in disagreement and said, No, you're not. You're friends and still playing the game. I felt a shiver down my spine. How about we play a game on our own while you wait for your friends? And that's when he finally showed us what was behind his back, a large machete. That's when I knew we had to get out of there. So I aimed my paintball gun and in the toughest way I could muster up, I told him, leave now or I'll shoot. Even though I only had about six to seven paintballs loaded and Joey did the exact same thing by aiming it at the man, even though he had no ammo left in his paintball gun. He didn't even flinch, but did something that honestly made my skin crawl. 
He just smiled and said, The game starts now. And suddenly he rushed at us, so I told Joey to run while I fired my last paintballs at him. And luckily, I got him in the head which caused him to fall. And that was our chance to book it and link up with our other friends. As soon as we started running, we heard the footsteps again. He was actually gaining on us, so we could barely see. But we couldn't slow down because we knew what would happen if we did. So we just carried on sprinting our hearts out until we heard other paintball guns being shot. So we knew we were close. Joey started shouting to get everyone's attention and all of a sudden I heard a huge thud. Joey trips and twists his ankle. I turn around to help him up and when I did I could see the man running at full sprint towards us. In that moment I thought it was going to be the end of us but our friend heard our screams and rushed to help us when he saw the man. They all started firing at him and he knew he wasn't going to be able to take us all on. So he opted to turn around and disappear into the woods. We helped Joey up and rushed off with our stuff to the cars. When we got to my friend's place, we helped Joey treat his ankle and I proceeded to tell my friends everything that happened and they were all creeped out. It's safe to say the next time I'm in those woods, I will be more vigilant. I worked in a kennels up in the mountains. In the depths of winter, it would be dark by 5 p.m. I'd be in the office finishing up some paperwork. At this stage, everyone would be gone, and this particular building was a bit far away from the main building and car park. All the dogs would be sleeping by this time after a busy day. You could hear a pin drop. Sometimes, I would hear definite, slow footsteps, so much so that I would get up, come out to the main front, ready to explain that we were closed but no one would be there. It used to freak me out. A few times I would even check the dogs in case it was coming from the kennels, but they were all sound asleep. I thought I'd share a few stories I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mother that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reservation to deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road, but we just call it the limit. And we use the area of forest for camping, fishing, ski do riding, and four wheel riding and stuff. But it's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. She had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad even has an experience on this road too. In fact, the road is known for all manner of strange things. But it's fine, no one's scared of it, and I drive down it to go watch pretty sunsets. It's chill. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there were no cell phones you could use to call for help, so they started walking. They weren't too far, and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. So they think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they approach it, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get closer and realize it is their car. They're confused as hell, but can completely verify it's their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of, Everything inside was exactly as they left it. They didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off the dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it onto another trail they could turn off of. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking, as it's all they could do. They kept going and sure enough, up ahead down the road there's a car parked, the same as before. This time they're tripping the hell out. They run up 
and it's their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same thing happens, they can at least see if the stick would be moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described a feeling of being afraid that the loop would just go on and on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk further and eventually made it back to the res. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what really happened. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. They really have zero idea, and neither do I. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later after the first incident, maybe early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver of course, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler out in the woods, because it's weird since there's no trail there. They look to see what he's talking about, and all you see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. You can see that there's a source of light, but you can't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She described that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but they were feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it, because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was a very low hum, but almost felt like a ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent, looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky, and they said they saw a UFO. This was so long ago, I wish I could describe more about it, but she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colours that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds and then just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again as it moved. And that's it. It's weird too that everyone's experience on this road is so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, the time loop. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit, apparently the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies kept trying to build mines, but we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because of the amount of paranormal stuff happening around here is pretty wild. I was a field geologist in the outback, about 12 hours north of Adelaide. One day I was driving the truck, and saw what looked like a flagpole sticking up in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't anywhere near a farm or anywhere else that people would be, so I decided to drive over and check it out. It was a dead dog, fully impaled on a spike, like from butt to mouth. Took some pictures and had my boss call the cops. But for the rest of the assignment, I was freaked out that some maniac was out there with me. So this story is from back when I was a 17-year-old moron, back in the spring of 2012. While it may seem dramatic, it had almost a decade to fester in that tiny box in our minds where we shove things that are best left alone. My little brother and I were spending the weekend with Dad. He had been leasing this cool house for about three years, near enough to the town centre that I could hop on a bus and hang out with friends. But right up against a massive forest, owned by the local university. I could open the sliding door in my room, and, if I felt like it, slide down a hill, crash through some blackberry bushes, be on a three mile loop trail that went against the fancy pants golf course the university also owned. Now, I was, as stated, a dumb teenager. And as a dumb teenager, I decided I would go out 
and about at night since Dad worked the night shift, and nobody, not my mum, not God, and not the crappy next-door neighbour lady could stop me from drawing inappropriate images in the golf course and sand traps at 1am, if that's what I wanted, which I did want. The sand traps are something I do not regret, so for those three years I did exactly that. When I was too keyed up to sleep or angry with stupid teenage things, I went out that sliding door once my brother was asleep, locked it, and went off into the woods. This was fine, except for the last time I did it. I skiddled down the hill at around 2am, and at this point, even in the dark, I knew how to get around the blackberry bushes without incident, chucked on my crappy old earbuds and got walking. I wasn't a super athletic person, but I could sprint decently, even if my asthma started burning my lungs almost instantly. I loved the outdoors, and I knew these woods like the back of my hand, so I was overconfident in my safety, which, as you'll soon see, was a big mistake. Everything was calm for maybe half an hour. I shuffled past the first long stretch of golf course and kept going until I realised that the forest had gone dead silent. Even at night, in late spring, in my state the woods are audibly full of animal life. I hear nothing. If you'd have told me that my crappy one dollar store earbuds could have saved my life that morning, I'd have laughed myself sick but that warning sign might have given me the rest of my life. I remember the thought, I've watched too many horror movies, but my gut still told me that something was off. I knew one tree that was easy to climb across the bridge over a nearby creek and made myself keep going. If I just got higher up, maybe I'd see a reason for the quiet. Then I heard footsteps on gravel, maybe 150 feet back. I decided not to wait. I picked up the pace and heard a sharp bark of shit as I rounded the turn at a sudden sprint. The brush was a thick curtain on that side, but if even I could have looked back through it, you could not have convinced me to do anything. The bridge was old wood marking where the wood opened up to a meadow and golf course on the side, the one I was barreling towards. The planks thudded as I passed it, it was so loud, and my heart was beating louder. I heard gravel back near that turn, and to this day I do not know why I flung myself past the post at the other side and down under that bridge. I remember the red clay mud cushioning my fall with a muted squelch. Spring rains had the creek swollen to a noisy little river. I pulled myself out, blindly cramming myself under the wood as it sloped to meet the bank with the splinters and spiders and praying to God, any that could hear me, that I was hidden. I then heard footsteps pounding from the other side of the bridge to somewhere above me. I crammed a filthy muddy hand over my mouth and tried to breathe deep and slow and silent. They were right there, the wood settling heavy over my head as mud plastered my thin t-shirt and ponytail to my back. The words I heard next were a jumble, but I heard, where, fast, that stupid girl, over and over. I remember wanting to let out a high hysterical laugh at first. I wasn't that fast. This was a young man's voice. But it was off and wrong sounding somehow. I wanted to laugh so hard. I had gotten college acceptances two months before and I had my life in order after a crappy stint as a teenager, and I was scared of some dumbass who couldn't even figure out I obviously couldn't have gotten out of sight in more ground that fast. He was starting to move back the way he came. It felt like a bad joke. The rest is anticlimactic. He left, and I hid until the sun started turning everything grey in the weak morning light. I unfolded my stiff limbs and followed the water out past the woods into a main road. I staggered along sidewalks back to my dad's house for almost an hour, jumping at shadows. My brother was still asleep when I got back. The dogs were on my bed, whining for pets. 
My dad came home while I was sitting in the shower and had coffee ready when I stumbled out. Or why I wasn't bawling in my overly fluffy robe as he passed me a big mug of coffee and went to take a shower of his own. But I never went back there after dark. I consider myself lucky. I still like forests and the outdoors because this could have ruined a lifelong hobby of mine. I still never have both earbuds in when I'm walking or hiking to this day. Always a bit worried if it gets too quiet. So to the guy who was in the woods, waiting for someone, maybe me, maybe someone else, let's not meet again. Sound fair? I once had an encounter with the trailside killer in Northern California in the late 70s while I was hiking with a friend. I came across him at a rocky outcrop on Mount Tam. He gave off a very discomforting vibe and we didn't hang around. The encounter was short. We attempted to exchange a few pleasantries as one does when seeing someone at a good resting spot, but it was weird and the entire thing felt off. So my buddy and I opted to keep walking and we did. We just got the wrong vibes from that guy. But strange enough that it stuck with both of us. That was until a few years later and his picture shows up in the paper. If I'd have been with my girlfriend, we may not have made it out of there alive. Who knows? I am usually pretty skeptical about the unexplainable. I have, in fact, shared stories about this in the past, as I've had many unexplainable things happen during my life. Anyway, the woods by my house here, I love them, they've never bothered me. I was in Boy Scouts for five years and I've never been creeped out by the woods. I've been alone in the woods and it's never been an issue. But those woods are different. I've never been in the woods, but I've been just outside them. Once I was waiting for my girlfriend's mum to fall asleep so she could sneak out for me. She told me to wait by the woods in my car. When I was there, I felt like I was being watched and felt very uneasy. I didn't feel safe at all. I didn't want to get out my car, to be honest, and I repeatedly made sure that my car was locked and I shrunk down in my seat a bit. Afterwards, I spoke to my girlfriend about it. She mentioned the woods in the past, but I didn't think it was those particular woods. She told me about some of the experiences she had in there. I trust my girlfriend not to make this kind of stuff up. She isn't that kind of person. But I'm more of a believer if it happens to me, or if I witness something personally. She shared with me a few experiences. Like once, she was in her car with her ex by the woods. I'm pretty sure it was exactly the same spot we were at, in fact. And they both heard a bone-chilling scream. It was off in the distance, so it was faint. It sounded like a woman's scream. She heard it a few times. She's also seen white humanoid figures with long arms. She told me that her and some of her friends went into the woods and would leave each other alone for a bit, as a sort of game. When it was her turn, she felt like she was being watched in all directions, and she heard leaves rustling like something was moving. It was only for five minutes, and then her friends came back. When it was her turn, they found them in a fetal position with scratch marks on their arm. They weren't too deep. Once they found the guy, they helped him and booked it out the woods. Despite those stories and being too afraid to get out my car, I didn't really have a reason to anyway. I want to go investigate for myself, but I sure as hell won't go alone. But my girlfriend is done with those woods. There's no way she'd ever go back there. If I ever do go into those woods, I'll record what I find and share it. Her house. I haven't seen much that happens in person. Most of it has been over FaceTime. I've only seen a few things for myself. Others, she'll tell me. We FaceTime late at night so she can sleep, as my presence relaxes her just knowing I'm there. One time when she was dead asleep, I saw the blanket slide off her a bit. It wasn't her moving or anything, the blanket just got pulled off, slowly, maybe an inch or so. I found that creepy to say the least. 
Her phone also has moved on its own while I've been on FaceTime. One time I heard tapping on her screen and thought it was her doing it to mess with me. I told her to knock it off because I was trying to sleep too. I look over at my phone and she was facing away from the phone in asleep. sleep. These are personal experiences I've had. Some of the things she's told me are creepy as hell, but I'm not quite sure I believe them. The real creepy stuff started happening a few weeks ago. She went to her dad's house about three hours north in the middle of nowhere, where she came back and started hearing footsteps running across her room late at night. She also hears laughing and crying. She feels like she's being watched, and she says she'll see a little girl hiding behind her closet door. She has a dresser next to her closet, and it leaves a little gap. That's where she says she sees the girl. The past few nights, she hasn't been able to sleep at all. I don't know if there really is a girl. Like I said, I haven't witnessed it myself, but whatever's going on, it really is keeping her up at night. I've spent the night at her house though. I've heard knocking on the windows. She has a fenced backyard and the fence is one of those tall plastic ones that would be quite challenging to get over. The creepiest part is knocking always happens during the witching hour. Three knocks, sometimes rapid and sometimes slower. She says it's every night. The one time I checked the time it was 3.20 and all I know it's between three to four. There's no way that it's a tree or anything like that. If it was, the fact that there's only one knocking around a specific time and only three times is very unlikely. Hopefully whatever's in her room doesn't follow her. We're looking to get an apartment together at the end of the year. In the meantime, at least, is there anything you can do to ward off whatever negative energies or entities there are? I've read somewhere that three knocks is a sign of a demon, but I'm not sure if it is anything like that. Or if there's anything that we can do at all. I also want to mention that her dad's house has a very dark energy. I'm good at sensing energies of places. One time we went there for a few days back in April. Whenever we were at the house, we were both irritable towards each other. We would leave and everything would be fine. She stayed there for a bit with her ex for a month and it caused a lot of issues and they ended up breaking up after staying there for a while. A little while after being there, we nearly break up. It's also important to say that she has had a traumatic past and a lot of horrible things have happened in that house. Nothing like anyone's life being taken. I don't want to go into details, but there certainly might be some dark things based on those events still lingering in the walls. One time I was walking my dog with my friend, who says that he could see spirits around some cliffs, and we took an overgrown trail, and there was a bunny hole. My dog stopped, stared at it, then booked it. We then heard metallic screeching sounds coming from that hole, and a feeling of wrongness came over me. My friend freaked the hell out and legged it. I ran too. When we got home, my dog was shivering and looked out the window and my friend and I still haven't figured out what it was. Days later, there was a landslide there, collapsing the cliff and probably killing or destroying whatever it was hiding in there. Perhaps we'll never know. This story happened just before lockdown but I've only just decided to share it because I still am unsure what happened. It happened in West Yorkshire in the UK. This occurred in the woods about 10 minutes away from my house in early March. My friends and I were all free on a weekend and decided to go down to a large flat area in the woods near the river. Around 3 p.m. I meet up with my friends, Wilma, Sarah, Barbara and Claire. After about 20 minutes, Barbara starts having a slight panic attack and goes off into the woods to calm down without telling us where she's going. She didn't come back after half an hour, so we're all a bit worried. So Claire and I decide to try and find her. We walked along an area with a signal and tried to call her, but she didn't pick up. After a few minutes, she texted Claire and told her she was fine, but might have to just go home. Claire and I walk back 
to where Wilma and Sarah are, and as we approach we see them over to the left, of the flat area, near an area that takes you along the river. The area was muddy from rain the previous day. We run down to ask them what they're doing, when Wilma tells us that she heard a loud whimpering coming from behind some trees. The area along the river is covered with foliage and trees, and we're all pretty freaked out, until Claire says that it could be Barbara trying to mess with us. We agree this is likely the option, but Sarah and I decide it would be best if we try and see what it is. We start walking down the side of the river, and we do reach the path which is slightly muddy from the rain, meaning you could see fresh prints in the mud. Unfortunately, Sarah already walked over it when we noticed footprints, so we couldn't be sure it wasn't accidentally them. We both kept to the sides of the path where it was more solid, and after about two minutes of walking we get to a fallen tree, where the path forks around it. We saw in the muddy path footprints, and when we looked closer handprints too, and they looked pretty recent. We thought it could have just been a person, but decided to crouch down and have a better look when we noticed something really weird. The footprints were bigger than ours, UK size 8, meaning it couldn't be Barbara as her feet are smaller, and the footprints were almost half as narrow as mine. We looked at the handprints and noticed something similar. The hands themselves were roughly as big as ours, but the palms were half as long, yet the fingers were normally sized. After this, we tried to go to the top path around the tree, but it was blocked off by a fallen branch, so we went to the bottom. When we got around the bottom, we saw that the path had ended, but also saw something else. After the end of the path, the long grass had been walked on and trampled down. It was obviously done recently, so now we were really freaking out. We followed the trampled grass until we reached an area where we could still see trampled foliage, but it went straight up a steep hill covered in trees and bushes. We decided there is nothing else we can do, and begin to head back to the flat. We're around 7 minutes away at this point, then we hear a loud whistle, not coming from our friends considering how far away they are. We are pretty shook, and start to rush back. When we get back, Wilma is the only one we immediately saw, so we assumed it was Claire and Barbara that whistled, and Barbara might have somehow been making the tracks. So we ran over to Wilma, and tell them what happened, when we see that Claire and Barbara and they have both been sat there for the time we've been away. After this we're a bit freaked out, but stay down there for around half an hour but decide to leave. I'm still unsure as to why, if it was a real person, they'd be walking down a path that leads to a hill barefoot. If it is of any help, there is some extra info. The mud was probably about a centimetre deep. I'm not an expert in tracking, but I don't think recent footprints would be disfigured that quickly, if only in about a centimetre of mud. It had been raining the day before, but not on the actual day. The actual day was somewhat warm and dry, but the woods were still damp. I've tried to do some research on animals and folklore and cryptids in the area, but can't really find anything. If anyone has an explanation for what we saw, I'd be hella grateful. I was hiking in a state park with a friend once, about a half mile away from the trail, and five miles from the trail's start. That's where we found a woman's blouse, some jeans that were ripped from the zipper to the crotch, and a pair of underwear. It all looked super dirty, like it had been there for a really long time. It really freaked me out, especially because it wasn't the type of clothes you would wear for a few miles hike. We reported it to the ranger station, and they said they would check it out, but I'm not sure if they ever did. When I got home, I looked for any crimes in the area in the past couple of years, but couldn't find anything. I haven't been back to those woods without a group since. Who knows? There could be some darker secret, still lurking in that woods, waiting to be discovered. I was camping in Florida, on the Appalachian Trail. I was approached by a group of inbred looking men, who started shouting at me. At first, I couldn't understand what they were saying, but as my brain slowly processed, did I understand the following. We could gut ya, 
and nobody heard you scream, and started pointing their rifles at me. I took off in the swamp and heard gunshots behind me, and they genuinely seemed disappointed that they missed. I don't camp alone, nor unarmed, anymore. This happened almost three years ago exactly. I had just turned 15, and in Findlay, where I live, turning 15 is a big thing for teens, since when you turn 15, you can get a 50cc moped license, and these kind of bikes are a huge part of youth culture here. Long story short, I just got my license and I was in a party at a friend's house. This friend of mine came from a wealthy family, and their family owned a huge plot of land, mostly full of inhabited forests and lakes. His house was pretty much in the middle of their land, and it was a very remote place surrounded by forest. The nearest village was at least 20 miles away. Although I lived pretty far away, I insisted on going by myself with my brand new moped, since I was so excited of finally having one. My parents were obviously against this, but ultimately, allowed me to drive myself there. The party lasted the entire day, and when it was around 2am I had to leave. Although their family is wealthy, the only road that connects my friend's house to the big main road is a long, badly kept, and narrowly paved road surrounded by forest. It is unsettling as hell, especially at night time. It should have been illuminated property, but at the time pretty much every single street lamp was either broken or tripped over by storms. I had asked them several times why they didn't take care of the road, but they simply replied that they weren't that interested in paying a huge amount of money for some company to come over and repave the entire road and replace every single streetlight. Since it's already completely dark, the only thing illuminating the road was the small single front light in my moped. After about 10 minutes on the road, I was about 5 or so minutes away from the main road, so it was still pitch black. Nothing was out of the ordinary until I saw movement in the corner of my eye. I saw a figure running from the pitch black forest and falling down on its face in the middle of the road in front of me with branches and leaves flying around it. I slammed the brakes and luckily avoided hitting the figure. The back brake locked up, so I ended up falling over and sliding along the road a bit. When I finally stopped, I looked up. I was okay apart from a few scratches, and looked to where the figure was laying. Of course, I thought that it was an animal like a moose or deer, but quickly realized it wasn't. It was an adult human. A man. At this point, he stood up. We were three meters from each other, just staring. I've never been more scared in my life. Even more disturbing was that this man seemed to me more scared of me than I of him. He was about 20 to 30 years old, short, thin, with a pale face and eyes that were deeply sunken into his sockets. If you know what a badly malnourished person's face looked like, you'll know exactly how he appeared. He was wearing a dirty turquoise hoodie, basketball shorts, despite it being less than five Celsius outside. He had unkept blonde hair full of debris and leaves, wearing no shoes, only soaking wet socks. At this point, he was constantly shaking, jolting, and glaring to the direction he came out of with a worried expression on his face, like he was being chased, or he knew there was something bad in the forest. I wanted to say something to him, but I was unable to come out with anything, and after a short while he looked straight at me and opened his mouth. It was like he was about to say something, but he quickly backpedaled, closed his mouth, and suddenly, and without warning, bolted to the forest without a flashlight or any source of light, vanishing quickly. I stood there for a while alone, before running to my moped, lifting it up, and driving as fast as I could to the main road. My moped had quite a few big dents, a broken front mask, and a damaged exhaust, but was still drivable. I drove home and woke up my parents to explain everything, while I was still shivering from shock. They obviously were furious that I had just crashed my moped, and didn't believe what happened. They thought I was just being a jackass on doing stunts until I fell over. I didn't get grounded, 
but they didn't let me drive at night anymore. I was alright with that, since I didn't want to do that either. For the entirety of the following week, I asked anyone who was at the party or living nearby if they'd seen anything unusual. I also followed the news to find out if there was anything bad that happened nearby that night, or if there was an escaped convict or a mental hospital patient loose. But nothing showed up, and no one else saw anything. I still sometimes think who that guy was, and what he was doing in the forest without a light in the middle of the night. I actually feel quite bad for the guy, and that I didn't help him because he seemed like he wasn't all that okay. Was he drunk? High? Perhaps in the middle of a bad trip? Or maybe some sort of psychosis? Was he abused? Part of a cult? I guess I'll never know, but I do wish I knew. I am an avid hunter in a rural town in Missouri. My family hunts on public land and we have hunted on the same ridge for multiple generations. The land used to be kept by a large sawmill that used mules to drag the trees to the mill in the nearby town. We have found all sorts of crazy stuff, railroad spikes in the middle of the woods, horseshoes grown into the side of trees, where they hung it on a limb. One of the craziest things I found in the woods was where a wagon had fallen off the side of a ridge, taking the mules with it. It's something like a 200 foot drop, so they just left everything down there. I've hiked by this thing hundreds of times, and from our hunting spot, the woods all rotted from it, but the metal brackets and wheels were still there, grown over and taken back by nature. One day while walking in the woods, I get to my spot that's probably half a mile from that spot that I've been sitting for the past few hours. When I hear what sounds like people yelling down the ridge, followed by a loud scream and a huge crashing sound. So I grabbed my gear and started to make my way out. When I get to where the wagon debris was, there was a flower wreath laid over the wagon, but I've never seen anyone down there except my family members and no one knows who might have put it there. We talked about that night back at camp, and we could only assume that if someone had passed in that wagon, maybe it was some distant grandchild or something, and that day was the anniversary of it happening. But that still doesn't explain the sound that I heard. I'm still hunting in the same place, but I've never heard or seen anything since. I'm wondering if anyone has ever had a similar experience or knows what this is, because this thing was a huge part of my life growing up. For years I felt crazy and just accepted I was seeing things, until I came across a few others who claimed to have experienced similar things to me. I was a super anxious kid, the eldest of three with a really unhealthy and unhappy family dynamic, up until I moved out. Every night, this heavy sense of dread would fall over the house, and I had major problems sleeping. When I eventually fell asleep, it would be restless and full of nightmares and sleep paralysis, which I still get frequently. A bit of background. When I hit about 12, I started waking up at 3am every night, thinking the room had suddenly lit up in a bright flash. I just passed it off as a car passing by and the headlights shining through the window. After a few months, I was still waking up at 3am, but before the white flash. It was like a jagged lightning streak across the ceiling, blinding light, and would light up the whole room and make me see spots. It used to terrify me. There was always the heavy dread fear feeling building when it happened, so I used to just lie as still as I could and try to sleep, or at least pretend to. This went on for years. It never got to a point where it didn't scare me, but I kind of got used to it, and even named it. One day when I was 16, my mother came to look in my room because she was getting pretty tired of me being all tired and angsty all the time. It's a really small box room, so it didn't take long, and there was absolutely nothing there. 
She went to take a shower and was alone in the hallway with the dread feeling building again. I decided to go into my room because it was daylight. What could happen? So I walk in. I froze in there. Everything was completely silent and the white light exploded from nothing in the middle of my room in front of my face, way brighter than the light in the room already and more branched out than I'd ever seen it before. Kind of like big fingers of lightning. It surrounded me for a second, then retracted back to the space from which it had come from. Needless to say, I lost my mind and had a Blair Witch Project level freak out with snot and everything. My mum and I went for a drive after that. Haven't seen the light that big since. But sometimes I catch a little flash here and there, but very rarely. About a year ago at a bar I work in, we were exchanging a few stories over drinks after hours. I told this story and one of my colleagues told me it was called house lightning. It's a common thing in Latvia where she's from. My boss also said he saw more or less the same flash in a forest a few decades ago, which incidentally is just across the road from where I grew up. Could it be related? Anyone seen anything similar or know what it could be? I completely accept the possibility it could have been a psychological thing, but I'm curious and so the people have seen it too. And I haven't been able to find anything about it online. My dad and I were hunting in the Poconos. So me and my dad were sitting in a hunting tower. It was cold as hell. And we start hearing what sounded like one of those old religious chants where they all sing together in Latin while walking in a straight line. It kept getting closer till we saw movement about 20 meters ahead. And then we saw a group of about 10 to 30 people, all in white holding candles. And then about five more people with rifles and shotguns standing in the front and back on the sides. We let them pass and they were staring at us as they walked by, but it was scary as hell. About 10 minutes after they walked by, we went over to the where they were standing. It was snowy out there and there were zero footsteps in the snow. And to this day, we still don't even know what the hell we saw. This story happened slightly over 20 years ago, back when I was 16. During this time, I lived with my mum and stepdad in a remote area 70 miles west of Las Vegas, Nevada. I had gone out to visit my friend, being allowed to drive myself for the first time ever. Had a lovely time watching a movie and getting food together until it was time for me to head home. The curfew I was given was 10 p.m., with the saving grace being that if I was running late for any reason to find a payphone and call. The night wrapped around me and my old 71 Chevy pickup as there were no street lights or houses for most of my way home. As I pulled up to the first of two stop signs, I could see an older sedan, old cars were still pretty common in the area, stopped with its hazards on. I pulled up behind it and waited as a man of 30 to 40 started walking towards me from the driver's side. Even at this point, I didn't have any alarm bells going off. Being in the middle of the Mojave Desert, providing assistance to stranded people was common. People rapidly get into severe problems, thereby not having enough water when a vehicle breaks down or not realizing that it's a desert and people die wandering delirious away from the highway trying to find help. I rolled down my window as he came abreast of my door, and all I could smell was the liquor on him. I could see another man in the passenger seat, as this was before anyone I knew had cell phones, and the nearest payphone was a good 10 minute drive ahead. I didn't have a way to call the cops on a drunk driver immediately. The man explained that his car stalled and asked if I could help them out. I asked if his car was stick shift, which it was, so I asked if he was familiar with push starting it. He said yes. So I agreed to, as gently as I could, push their car with my truck while they turned the engine over. For anyone who isn't familiar with this technique, it's a way to start a manual car that is having battery or starter issues specifically, to get it somewhere to work it on. I knew my truck would be fine and didn't feel like it would be wise to get out and try to push their car physically. Pushing 
started the car working without a hitch. But here's where things go south. They get out to thank me and invite me to hang out with them to have some fun. I respectfully decline. They pull off to the side of the road and I continue on my way. Only they start following me. So here I am, 9.50 and running late because I stopped to help them. Admittedly, I haven't given myself much leeway since leaving my friend's house. And these drunk, creepy older men have started to follow me on a road without any man-made lights except for my headlights. And I'm at least 10 minutes from a payphone. I think to myself, perhaps I'm being paranoid. So I turn down a road that I know gave me a few turnoffs to either head back to town or loop around to the gas station with a payphone. The car follows behind me. I take another turn that only leads to a couple of houses at the end of the road, and they turned behind me. I make another turn to loop around back and had the station, and they follow me again. So at least I knew they were following me and not just heading home. At this point, my heart is pounding. I decided to try something to lose them. I pull to the side of the road. I see them pull up behind me. I wait as the driver gets out the car and begins walking towards me. His companion also gets out and starts walking towards me, and I wait until they're almost at my tailgate and then floor it. My wheels dig into the rocks and puff dirt, causing a cloud behind me. With the lead way, I head towards the gas station. The gas station is deserted, but the payphone is showered in light from the gas pumps. So I call home and explained what happened and why I was running late. My stepdad asked if the gas station worker could be seen and I let him know I couldn't see him behind the counter and that he was probably in the back. I wasn't in trouble, but I was asked to hurry home. So to the two drunk idiots that wanted to mess with 16 year old me on the first night driving by myself, let's not meet again. In middle school, I worked at the school during the summer doing general painting and helping the maintenance guys. We had to drive out to the middle of the Floridian forest to pick up some pine lumber for the gym's new bleachers. And when we got to the mill at 7am, the whole place was locked down with police. They had found gasoline cans and pill bottles out in one of the farm groves, telltale signs of kids abusing substances, but supposedly the cops were there because they found human remains. I was pretty young and don't remember anything outside of my little kid point of view, but I remember seeing dark streaks of blood running up the trunks of several pines. I've since learned from the guys I was with then that a teenager had his life ended by a bear after attacking it, and the blood was either from the wounded bear climbing a tree or dragging a hurt person up with it. But I'm sure you can agree with me that bears don't do that and I can't see an injured bear making up several pines in a row while bleeding to that. So technically I saw a creepy thing while working in a remote area. Look up Lakeland Mill casualties or something to find it. The story of the kids passing was in the local paper. I fly helicopters over power lines in remote parts of the country. I once saw what I thought was a human leg sticking out of the woods in a very small clearing in the trees. It shook me enough that I went back to the location and got some of the ground crewmen to go back and look while I hovered as low as I could without hitting the rotors on the trees. When we get there, he says he can't exactly see what it is. We go back and grab a pair of binoculars so that he can get a closer look. Turns out, it was a cow. The catch was that it had no skin, none at all. A perfect cow without any of its skin. No animal had eaten it yet, so it was still fully intact. There were no farms around for a 50 mile radius, and I still have no clue how it ended up there in the manner that it was. I still remember the, geez, that's a body, feeling I had when I think of this story. I used to live near a really well-known forest. It was claimed to be haunted, known as Black Forest. 
Now this forest is super creepy, and as you can imagine, dark, hence the name. I had one very scary and startling experience while driving through this forest, which made me never step foot in the area again. On a weekend, I was invited to go hang out with some friends, and I had nothing else to do, so I agreed. It was around 8 or 9, and it was dark out. Now, there are two ways I could get to my friend's house. One, go through Black Forest, or two, go around the forest and add 20 minutes to my journey. I usually avoid the forest because the roads are somewhat confusing, and I just couldn't see very well, there being no lights and all. However, today, I was impatient, and decided to go through the forest. The ride to my friend's house was very uneventful, but the darkness of it all was very unpleasant to say the least. I stayed at my friend's house and started to head back around midnight, or near enough 1am. Now, this is when I had my experience. While I was driving, I looked at my GPS a lot, because of the roads, and I always wanted to check where I was going, because some of these roads looked like an actual road, but are merely driveways for a lot of these houses. I didn't want to trap myself in someone's driveway, so I checked my GPS a lot. So I was driving and came to a stop in front of a red light, right under a very dim street light. It was still pitch black, and I was the only one on the road. As I was getting there, I got a very weird feeling as if someone was watching me. I then looked to my passenger side door, only to see this glowing, zombie-looking-like man, wearing what I could only describe as rags. He didn't look alive. His skin looked like it was falling off. He was very grey in colour, and was just staring at me. I really thought my heart was going to explode because I was so scared. Even though the light was red, I floored it. But I wanted to see if the thing staring into my car was actually real. And right as I crossed through the median, I looked back. Nothing was there, and there was nowhere he could have gone that fast. I was spooked and drove all the way home, trying not to hit any red lights. This was right before a huge forest fire. I used to work for an IT company in the gaming industry, whose office was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by farms and forest. One day, one of the development team had come in from a walk in the forest, and was visibly upset. Turns out she came across a dead fox, the thing that was concerning is that she said it was hanging from a tree, and looked like it was put there on purpose. So a bit later on, a few of us went down to have a look. We came across a small clearing with the dead fox hanging there. Upon closer expansion, we realised it had been hung by its neck, with an incision from its balls to its throat, and all of its insides had been pulled out. We felt pretty sick from that one. We got it down from the branch and chucked it into the bushes away from the path and clearing. Still to this day, I have no idea why or how it was in that state. This was when I was about 13. I was at church camp, which had a cliff nearby. Of course, my two tentmates and I snuck out during the middle of the night to go see the stars. It was a magnificent view. We were all from the city, so being in the middle of the forest was exciting, since we couldn't see many stars at home. So we hiked the mile to the cliff and stand there for a few minutes in silence. Across the valley, I see a light on the mountain. I assumed it was a car, because it was going sideways, like it was on a road. But then it started to go straight down the mountain, which would have been impossible for a car because no roads go straight down it. The light started to speed up, and was heading right towards us. The light made it to the bottom of the huge mountain within two to three minutes. It must have been going at least 70 miles per hour. We all stood our ground, not saying a word. When it got to the valley, it went even faster, and was still coming right towards us. We saw it still only had one massive light instead of two like a car, and it was huge. I don't think a dirt bike could have had that big of a light, even in the dark. The moon was so bright you could have gotten away with no headlights, 
We finally ran when it got three quarters of the way across the valley. It was strangely terrifying. Once the light appeared there, there was a heavy feeling of horror that we only spoke about once. One friend thought it was so scary. She pushed us down to get by us while we were running up the hill on our way to camp. In the morning, we told the grown ups about it and they didn't really believe us. One said there was a sighting of a strange man who was snooping around. So the light was a warning to get back to camp. I suppose being a mile away in the dark as 13 year olds is pretty dangerous. I don't believe in ghosts and spirits. And it could have just been a dirt bike or something. But I haven't felt that amount of terror since. I was in Southeast Alaska for around 15 days a few summers ago. We had just finished up dinner and washed out our pots and pans and had gone into our respective tents in the trees along the shore that we had stopped at for the night. The spot we had chosen to camp at wasn't ideal. The tide was set to come in pretty far that night and would only leave us with a few feet before the water would be lapping up at our tent flaps. But we also didn't care that much as it had been raining and incredibly windy that day. So kayaking was hardly any fun at all. And we needed to stop. About 45 minutes after we said good night to one another, I heard some splashing in the tidal zone probably 20 feet from my tent. I didn't think much of it because a few times before when in Alaska, we had stopped at beaches where the tide had risen within a few feet of our tents. I tried to ignore it. Although in my mind, I'm freaking out. Our camp spot was less than ideal if you wanted to escape in the middle of the night. We were at the base of a relatively steep hill that was covered in alders and slick with rain. To the left, probably 70 feet of where we camped, there was a rocky outcrop that went out into the water and was about 20 feet tall and steep enough that you couldn't climb it. For example, a grizzly bear and there were lots out in the summer. We had seen four or five times that day alone patrolling the beaches. It wanted to see what was going on down the beach and walk towards us from the right. And it would basically seal off our movement. Sort of like putting the cork back in a wine bottle. Not many places to go. After 15 minutes of hearing splashing, I start to try and rationalize enough to go to sleep. But that's when I start hearing something other than splashing. This incredibly high pitched gargling sound breaks through the night's relatively quiet air. It sound as though two cats had gotten into a fight. But every time they let out a scream, the other cat would push one cat's head underwater. This went on for a good 20 minutes. After it died down, I hear that's weird, huh? From the other tent, obviously trying to downplay the incident. I being scared as hell, just reply, yep, gonna sleep. 15 minutes pass without as much of a sound. But then the same gargling breaks through the night, this time much closer. The noises are deeper this time, more guttural. It sounds like an old man fighting with a cat. And each time each of them shriek, they are forced underwater. The splashing intensifies. And it sounds like it's coming from right outside my tent. I think that the fear of whatever was going on eventually just zapped me of all my energy because eventually I fell asleep. I just remember that I didn't move a muscle and I didn't move for so long that all of my muscles ached after a while and I could feel my heart beat in my throat all night long. We woke up, had breakfast, broke down the tents and got back on the road. Didn't hear it ever again. A few weeks later, I did some Googling. And I'm pretty sure it was just sea otters fighting each other in the intertidal zone. But it was scary as hell. I grew up on a farm. And in high school, I used to mess with my friends by hiding and making them find me. One night, my friend was over and we were waiting on this other guy. We see him pull up. So we take off running to hide. It's funny because they have to wander around somewhere they're unfamiliar with or go ask my parents and be told too bad, you'll have to find her. 
It's like a forced hide and seek. Anyway, this one night, my friend hid in one of the buildings while I ran for the trees. I was hiding under some bushes and heard breathing, like human breathing. There were no animals about, and it creeped me out so bad I ran out of the hiding to greet my friend. I felt so uncomfortable for the rest of the night. Sometime during the night, my dad heard something and went out to investigate. In the morning, he discovered that one of our cows was killed and butchered. <laughs>